teaching this morning from the book of Judges, chapter number 6. So I invite you to turn in your Bibles, if you will. As you can see, our next champion that we are discussing today is a man by the name of Gideon. And I'm excited to be able to share what is on my heart about this young man out of the sixth chapter of the book of Judges. So if you will take a moment and turn there with me. And as you are turning, I invite you to stand one more time with me as we go to the word of the Lord together. And again, you may, if this is your first time here, we stand only because we believe this is the inspired word of Almighty God. How many believe this is our inheritance today? Amen. I said, this is our inheritance. Everything that is in this book, you have the ability and the capability of possessing in your life by the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Lift up your Bible. Say, everything in this book is mine. Do you believe it? Amen. All right. Here we go. So Judges chapter number 6, as we read together, Judges chapter number 6, I'm going to begin reading in verse number 11. Judges chapter number 6 and verse number 11. Again, thank you for being in the house of the Lord today. We appreciate your attendance and your faithfulness. Verse 11, if you have it, say amen. The Bible said, The angel of the Lord came and sat under a terebinth tree, which was an Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, the Abias right, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why then has all of this happened to us? Where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us from Egypt? But now the Lord's forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? And he said, verse 15, Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan, it's the weakest in Manasseh. I'm the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, surely I am with you, and you will defeat the Midianites as one man. Amen. Praise God. I am using this text today as we move to part number six of our current series, which is entitled Champions. I'm using this to preach to you on this subject, the reluctant champion, the reluctant champion. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I introduced to you a young man by the name of Gideon. I introduce him to you because Gideon is one of the most, to me, amazing stories in the Old Testament. In fact, if you had to rank in the top ten, this is one of the greatest stories of heroism, one of the greatest stories of courage, a story of a young man with no military background, no leadership experience, had done actually nothing in his life, yet God used him to raise a ragtag army of 300 Israelites to take on a Syrian army of 135 thousand. Now, you do the math. That is amazing odds not in his favor. But yet God used him to lead this ragtag group of Israelites into a battle that was fought in the most unorthodox ways, a battle that was fought armed only with a pitcher and a lamp. One man had a horn and horns, and at the given time, the horns were blown. The pitchers were broken. And it was the sound of the shout of these men when they cried out the sword of the Lord and Gideon. It was the sound of the horns that brought such confusion to the Syrians that they literally turned on each other and began to slay each other. And those that escaped this self-inflicted battle, they ran right into the hands of the 30,000 Israelites that Gideon by the command of God, had already sent home. And these sideline soldiers were picking these Syrians off like flies. I mean, they ran right into an ambush, and Gideon was given one of the greatest victories in Jewish history. Now, I don't know if you really understand the significance of that, but how many know everything in this book is actually true? Let me hear you say amen. This is not a fairy tale, all right? This is not DreamWorks coming up with a big screen classic for you to go eat some popcorn and watch a movie, this actually happened. So imagine now this man has been given the most unorthodox and amazing victory over the Syrians by the power of God. So much so the Israelites, Gideon, be our king, they said. Be our ruler. And Gideon said, no, God is your king. God is your ruler. And he declined. It's a great story, but I'm not going to preach on that. 
I just told you the story. It's easy to get up and preach about the sword of the Lord and Gideon, get on our feet and shout about the victory and how God's uh, going to use uh, the unbelievable and you're outmanned and outnumbered and God's going to turn your enemies against each other and you're going to come out of this thing victorious and, man, we get all excited, but I'm not going to preach about that. I'm not going to preach about the battle. I'm not going to preach about the calling. I'm not going to preach about the sword. I'm not going to preach about any of that because I feel led to preach about the precursor to the battle. I feel led to preach about the man that was behind the battle because as valiant and as much of a champion as Gideon was in the battle, he was not always that way. In fact, he was a man that was so full of insecurity, so full of doubt, so full of fear that the Lord had to convince him to actually step up and do what he was called to do. The reality is Gideon had to win the battle within himself before he could ever win the battle against the Syrians. Because if you don't win the internal battle with insecurity, doubt, and fear, you will never win the external battle against the enemy that is raging against your soul. And I feel as I prayed and as I studied this passage today, I feel like I was supposed to preach to many in this congregation that today you are battling that self-doubt and you are battling that self-insecure spirit that is within you causing you to feel as if you do not have the ability to become the champion that you are designed to be. There are so many people, they are defeated before they ever even get out of bed. The moment their eyes open, immediately they are flooded with thoughts of doubt and fear. They are flooded with insecurity, thinking, my boss hates me. My coworkers are talking against me. I will never succeed. I will never do anything in life. Nothing good is ever going to happen. In fact, so many people, that's why they push the snooze button five times and sleep an extra 45 minutes, because they're already defeated before their feet ever hit the floor. And it's no wonder that their life is like a hamster on a wheel, spinning and going absolutely nowhere. And that might be you today. You might be so full of doubt and so full of insecurity, but I want you to know, God can take a Gideon that is so insecure about himself, and he can make him into a valiant champion that will rise and go down in the history books as one of the greatest military geniuses in all of Jewish history. And brother, I want to tell you this morning, amen, the same God that called Gideon, is walking into this house right now and he is ready to take the insecurity, the doubt, and the fear out of your life and call you to be a champion. How many will receive it? I want you to shout amen. You are facing some of the self-doubt, some of the uh, self-fear, some of the insecurity that Gideon had to face. And now when I say champion, don't get in your head that I'm talking about some he-man with bulging biceps uh, that comes and just throws everybody down to the mat. And he's the guy that just walks in and just throws people around. I'm talking about a champion. Amen. You may be a 97-pound weakling in the flesh, uh, but in the spirit, you can be a man or a woman of God that can change the environment uh, of the world in which you you live. Amen. I'm talking about people that walk into a place and spiritually everything begins to shift because of the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost that is upon them. They can walk into a job and suddenly in the realm of the spirit, come on somebody, the environment will shift. The environment will change. Amen. Men, we need you. Dad, we need you to be a champion in your household. Mom, we need you to be a champion on your job. These students, we need you to be a champion in your high school classroom. You college students, uh, we've got to have you be a champion uh, on your campuses because guess what? How many know this world, it it needs uh, the environment in the realm of the spirit shifted. It needs to change uh, and it's going to come because uh, of some champions. Amen. So as I look at this passage, Israel is in a place where the environment was in desperate need of change. When you look at verse 1, follow with me through the text, if you will. The Bible said they had been delivered by God into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. Because of the Midianites, they had actually made them dens in the mountains, in the caves, and the strongholds. The Midianites were so intimidating that 
Israel literally had been driven underground. They were hiding. They were living in caves. They were living in strongholds. They were living in the mountains. It was a pitiful sight. Frustrated, discouraged. They were just beyond imagination, bound in fear. Because every time, look in verse number 5, every time that uh, the... the uh, harvest would come these Midianites would come in like a rave of locusts and they would destroy everything what they didn't destroy they would literally take with them and so God he sends a prophet and the prophet comes in verse number eight and he tries to remind them he said listen Israel he said I brought you out of Egypt I brought you out of the house of bondage I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians I took you out of the hand of all that oppressed you I drove them out before you I said I'm the Lord your God so don't fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land that you dwell how many know sometimes God has to remind you of where he has brought you from so that you can better see where he is taking you to Amen. Listen, I don't care where you are right now. I want you to know the God that brought you out and delivered you 20 years ago is the same God that's going to deliver you today because he has never changed. And sometimes you just need to remember, hey, God, you did it then. I'm going to dare to believe that you are going to do it now because, listen, friend, there is absolutely no situation that is beyond the control of the delivering power of Almighty God. He did it once. How many believe he will do it again? Come on, somebody shout amen but even with the prophetic word it wasn't enough they needed a champion they needed somebody that was going to rise and that was going to lead them and Gideon was that champion but here's the deal before Israel could believe in Gideon as their champion Gideon had to believe in himself as their champion because until Gideon believed that he had the anointing of God upon his life, he would never be able to lead Israel. Listen, my friend, I want to tell you right now, you might think that you are simply a housewife staying at home, but there is something that God has called you to do. And until you believe that the power of the Most High God is within you, and you believe that you can step out and make a difference, you will never see God work in your life. Amen. Something is about to change today because you're going to start believing in who God has made you to be. And so let's go through this. Let's walk this journey of reluctance with Gideon for a moment. I want to give you three reasons why he was reluctant. And by so doing, I want you to see the reluctance that is within you. Number one, reluctant reason is this. Gideon allowed fear to be more powerful than faith. Look in verse number 11 of our text where the Bible said the angel of the Lord, which I believe was Jesus, uh, another Christophany, Old Testament appearance of the Lord, sat under an oak which was in Ophrah that pertained to Joash the Abiasrite and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress uh, to hide it from the Midianites. Gideon is in a place that he did not belong. I want you to think about this. Look at that text. He's threshing wheat where? In the winepress. He has no business being in the wine press. The wine press is not where you thresh wheat. Wheat is threshed by you going up on the hillside. It is going into the open where the air, as you throw the wheat into the air as they would thresh it, the wind would blow the chaff and would separate the wind from the, or separate the wheat from the chaff. But instead, because of fear and intimidation, Gideon had literally gone to a lower place in the wine press. The wine press, you can't thresh wheat because you can't bring the oxen to tread out uh, the, uh, the oxen to tread out the wheat in the wine press. You can't pull the wheel over the grain. You can't get the product that you should be able to while you are in the wine press. But the reason that Gideon is in the wine press is because he is so afraid of what the Midianites are going to do. That if I'm out in the open and I'm threshing wheat, the Midianites are going to come and they're going to steal the wheat that I have produced through the threshing process. And so I've got to do what I do in hiding so that the Midianites don't take what God has given to me through the threshing of this wheat. And now, I want to tell you the reason that I feel, amen, God wants me to say this is because fear is one of the biggest and most popular weapons that the enemy of your soul is going to use against you. 
Fear is something that is going to drive you into a place that you have absolutely no business being and drive you into doing something that you have no business doing. Amen. The enemy is a master intimidator. He is a master manipulator. And he will drive the spirit of fear at you and try to get you to be so worried about what people are going to do and people are going to say. Come on, somebody. How many know fear is a real battle that you have to fight on a regular basis. Amen. Any time that you begin to launch out into what God is dealing with your heart, you're always afraid of what people are going to say. How many know people are always going to talk? Come on, raise your hand and say amen. People are always, I don't care what you do. You can be good. You can be, you can be whatever. Amen. People are always going to have an opinion, but just somebody has an opinion just because their opinion is made known does not mean that should stop you from doing what God has called you to do because the opinion of man is not going to stand but the word of the Lord it is going to abide forever come on somebody you got to realize the devil has got you convinced that you should live in fear and intimidation and it's brought you to a place you have no business belonging fear is that looming giant in your mind keeping you from coming out in the open with what God has called you to do because of that, you're hidden in the wine press. You should be out in the open. You should be out in the open. You should be enjoying life. You should be shouting the victory. You should be living in the favor of God. You should be living in the blessing of God and letting the world know that Jehovah reigns upon the throne of your heart. You should be living as a king and a priest. Oh, come on. You got, you got to know, church. Amen. We are more than a conqueror through the Lord Jesus Christ. But instead, we are living down, tucked away, hidden in the wine press, doing, amen, out of the sight of individuals when the Lord is saying, come on, get up out of there. Stop letting the enemy put fear into your life because fear is a spirit out of the pit of hell that was broken the time that Jesus went to the cross. He broke fear. He defeated it. He took authority over it. And consequently, I declare in the name of Jesus Fear is broken out of your life. If you receive it, shout amen. God told Joshua, he said, have not I commanded you? I'm telling you, have, God is saying, haven't I commanded you? Be strong. Shout, be strong. Come on, touch your neighbor, say, be strong and of a good courage. He said, be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. Why? Because the Lord of God, thy God, is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Can I tell you, he is with you in the office. He is with you on the job. He is with you in your house. He is with you when you're driving your car. He's with you when everybody says it is impossible. You've got the God of all heaven that has stuck. Come on. There's no reason to be afraid. There's no reason to be filled with fear and doubt and intimidation. The psalmist said, the Lord is my light. He is my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Fear is your imagination running out of control. Fear is your imagination running out of control. God has given every single one of you a beautiful gift of imagination. You have the ability to see things that don't yet exist. You know what I'm talking about? You have the ability to see things not as they are, but rather as they could be. God has given that to you. Because you see, when God created the world, the Bible said the earth was without form and it was void. And God, the Spirit of God, moved upon the darkness. And God called those things that be not, Romans 4 said, as though they were. He called it out of, come on, church. I want you to understand this morning, God has given you the ability, amen, to call things that are not yet in existence. And you can call them into reality by the faith that is within you. Listen, my friend, you can call that job into reality. 
reality. You can call that relationship into reality. You can see your family healed. You can see your marriage on top. You can see your body healed. You can see your mind restored. God has given you that ability. It is called faith. Amen. Hallelujah. Everything that God does in your life, it is by faith. Amen. It is you seeing something that does not yet exist and saying by the grace of God and in the name of Jesus, I declare this to be a reality and I renounce any doubt and fear because I have the faith to see it happen. Amen. What are you missing today because you've not yet called it into reality? You say, oh, pastor, come on, I can't do it. Yes, you can. You know why you can? Because you are created in the image of God. And the faith of God is a seed planted inside of you. But hear me now. The devil will take that same ability to imagine. And what God wants to be used for faith, he will use it for fear. In other words, he will cause you to imagine things that are not true and you then will begin to operate in fear. You're so afraid. Everybody's talking about me. Everybody's talking about me. Everybody's gossiping about me. Now, don't look like you don't ever think those thoughts. Everybody's talking about me. What are they going to say if I say that I'm called to the ministry? What are they going to say if I say that God has called me to be an entrepreneur and open my own business? What are they going to say? What if I step out and I fail? What if I step out and I fall on my face? What if I step out and it doesn't work the way that I want to? These are real thoughts. Amen. These are real fears. But you see, the Lord is saying that until you are able to win that battle of the fear of what man says, man does and the fear of failure you will never become the champion and that's why today around this altar I'm taking authority and saying every single one of you will no longer operate in fear you will operate in faith and begin to see what God can and will do in your life amen because fear will bring stress will bring worry will bring anxiety into your life and church i have said it before and i believe it we are living in the most anxious world that i have ever seen and the bible said philippians 4 to be careful to be anxious for nothing shout the word nothing nothing what Paul is saying, he said, don't worry about anything. Because the word careful in the Greek literally means to be pulled in two different directions. Now, I've been there. But when you're worried about something, how many feel like the insides are being pulled apart? You can't sleep at night because you're worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. You can't sleep at night because you're worried about what your boss is going to say. But you see, the Bible said you can't worry about anything. And so today, I am declaring a no-worry congregation because I don't want you to be pulled apart. I want you to be pulled up. And so you will not worry anymore because the Word of God said be anxious for nothing. Amen. The Anglo-Saxon word of worry literally means to asphyxiate, to strangle, to choke off. Think about that. Worry is like two hands that are wrapped around your neck and you cannot breathe and you cannot have life. And I've got a prophetic word for somebody that the reason the dream has not yet come to pass and is not alive is because anxiety and worry has strangled the life out of the dream that God has given to you. And I rebuke that anxiety in the name of Jesus and I will breathe again and and I will live again because worry is not going to strangle the life out of the dream God has given to me. If you receive it, shout amen. Get out of the wine press. 
Get on the hillside. He was reluctant because he allowed fear to become more powerful than faith. But number two, the reason that Gideon was so reluctant is because he allowed history to be more powerful than his destiny. Look in verse 12. The Bible said the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. To which Gideon responded in verse 15, he said, Lord, how can I save Israel? <laughs> my family is so poor in Manasseh. He said, I am the least in my father's house. I want you to write this down. God is your sole source of identity. Champions choose God as the sole source of their identity. Your identity is not in your job. Your identity is not in your spouse. Your identity is not in your boyfriend or your girlfriend. It is in God and in God alone. Because the Lord came to Gideon. He said, you're a mighty man of valor. What I love about that is that God didn't call Gideon for what he was at the moment. He called Gideon for what he could be in the future. He said, you're a, now that's the furthest thing from the truth. Gideon is not a champion. He's not a warrior. He's not a valiant man. He's living in a country that is backslidden, living in spiritual darkness. And his own family is a bunch of idolatrous Baal worshipers. Because the first thing that God told Gideon, he said, you need to go. He said, he said you need to take your father's grove that has been built unto Baal. Verse 25 in our text. He said, take the altar of Baal that your father hath and cut down the grove that is by it. In other words, Gideon, your family is a bunch of lost, idolatrous Baal worshipers. And you are living in a spiritually dark society and nation. And beyond that, Gideon said, not only are they idolatrous he said my family is living in abject poverty he said my family is the poorest family in Manasseh and not only is my family the poorest family he said I am the least in my family he said, I am the weakest man in the weakest clan. But you see, what Jesus did is he didn't change his opinion of Gideon based on the family that he came out of. He said, Gideon, I don't care if you come out of an idolatrous Baal worshiping family. I don't care if you come out of a country that is so spiritually dark. I don't care if your family is in abject poverty. He said, you are a mighty man of valor. You know why? Because God does and qualify you based on your history. God qualifies you based on your destiny. And God qualifies you not based on who your daddy or your mama was or what side of town you come out of. He doesn't qualify you based on your 401k or how much money you've got or the title that is on your door. He doesn't qualify you based on how long you've been in church. Amen. God said, Gideon, I put something inside of you that nobody can take away. I put something deep inside of you. That's your family can't take away. This country can't take away. Baal can't take away. I put it inside of you and I'm calling it out. I'm calling it out. I'm calling you a mighty man of valor. I'm calling you a champion. I'm calling you something that you don't believe. And Gideon saw he was qualified based on what God had put inside of him. Church, let me tell you right now. Some of you say, my daddy was an alcoholic. My mama was a drug addict. I was, I was raised on the wrong side of town where the elites never come. Let me tell you, God it doesn't care who your daddy was or your mama was. God said, I put something inside of you that nobody can take out. Nobody can defeat. Nobody can squelch. I put it there. I created you. I planted that seed. I put it deep within you. Don't you dare talk about your history when I'm talking about your destiny, amen. Oh, come on somebody, give the Lord some praise right now. He's calling it out. I said he's calling it out. Hallelujah. He's calling out the seed. He's calling out the seed of valiancy. Stop living According to what everybody else says. Start living according to what God said. I'm going to say it again because somebody needs to hear that. 
You're living because somebody said you're a loser. You think you're a loser. But God said you were a child of the Most High God. Oh, the anointing of the Holy Ghost is upon you. And you are a high priest under God. And a king that walks in royal authority. My God, you got to stop listening to the losers and the complainers and the gossipers. And get the word of God out and say, this is who I am. I declare my God right now. I am what this book says. And I will not live in my history. I will walk into my Destiny, amen. Now you be a pastor. That's the story of my life, though. I can't change my I can't change my history. The story of my life. That's all I've known. It's time to rewrite the story. You're right, you can't change the story. You can't change what you did 10 years ago. But you can rewrite the next 10 years. Oh, hallelujah. My God, somebody just got something right there. You're going to start to rewrite your story starting today on the 29th day of October. You got a brand new story, a blank page, a blank chapter, and a blank book in front of you. And you're going to rewrite it. What the devil wrote you off with, you're going to say, by the grace of God, I am rewriting it starting today. I am who I am. I am who God said that I am. And I will rewrite the rest of my life. Oh, but pastor... That's the story I was born with. Get born again. Because the only way to rewrite your story is to be born again. Oh, come on, church. I want you to hear me now. You can't just add Jesus uh, to the story that you've already got uh, and expect it to get better. You can't just add Jesus uh, to what you are already doing uh, and expect it to get better. You've got to rewrite uh, by saying, God, I may have been born, uh, amen, to a drug addict, but now I'm born again. And now I'm born to the King of Kings. uh, And my God, uh, you're living according to what your physical daddy said when you should be living according to what your heavenly daddy said. You're living according to your earthly family when you should be living according to your spiritual family. You have been born again and the seed of Almighty God is within you. And let me tell you, I just, I want to, we're living in a day right now where people are just trying to add Jesus to what they're already doing. And, 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 and I'm going to give you exactly what I feel like the Lord wanted me to give you. You just can't come to, chi- to, to church uh, and just add Jesus to your life. Uh, and just simply say, well, I'm going to keep on living the way I'm, but I've got Jesus. Now I'm gonna, no, listen, my friend, when you find Jesus, uh, he transforms you from the inside out. Uh, and all of that filthy stuff you used to do, suddenly you don't have an appetite for it anymore. It is gone. Why? Because you have been born again. Amen. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again. We're not looking for people just to come to church. We're looking for people to follow Jesus. I don't want to build an attendance. I want to build disciples. Amen. We're looking for Jesus followers that are sold out. Their appetite has changed. Their lifestyle has changed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many are glad you're born again? Let me hear you shout amen. I said born again. Born again. My story is different because uh, I've got a new daddy. I've got a new family. (laughs) Gideon, he was reluctant because he let, let his history become more powerful than his destiny. And number three, Gideon was reluctant Because he allowed the present to be more powerful than the promise. Look in verse 13. He said, oh, Lord, all right. So if the Lord is with us, then why then is all this befallen us? Where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, did not the Lord bring us 
out of Egypt, but now the Lord's forsaken us. And he's delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. You see, the problem was Gideon was looking around saying, okay, if what you are saying is true, then why in the world is all of this happening to us? And so many times, let me tell you, the devil's going to come and tell you, if God is really who he said that he is, you would not be going through the struggle that you're going through right now. And the temptation is for you to look around and say, Lord, if really you are who you said that you are, then why do I have to go through this in my marriage? Why do I have to go through this in my family? Why do I have to face this battle? And the devil's going to whisper, see, 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 if you were really a child of God, you wouldn't be going through the battle. But I want to tell you, don't allow your current situation to become your future reality. Because you see, my friend, yes, it might get tough in the moment but what you are going through right now is not permanent it is temporary and the one thing that you do know is that the problem you are facing is only here for a season and it is here for a reason and the reason is is because God is building your spiritual muscle because there is a battle ahead that you're going to have to fight and the only way to get there is to go through what you are going through right now so God can raise you up and experience the blessing of Almighty God. Do you believe it? Shout amen. Do not let your current reality become your future finality. Because you know why? God is never done working on you. Touch somebody, say he's working on me. He's working on me. He's working me out. <laughs> I said he's working me out. He's got me on the spiritual treadmill and I'm working out. He's got me in the spiritual weight room and I'm working out. You know why? Because I believe I'm going to emerge as a man and a woman of God that is so strong you will not even recognize who I am. And you're going to come out and say, <laughs> now who is that woman? She's been through hell, but she came out victorious. She She's been through death, but she came out resurrected. She's been through opposition, but she came out as an overcomer. Let me tell you, my friend, do not let your current situation become your finality. Because the one thing you know is true is that Jesus said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you the one thing you know is true is that I may walk through the valley of the shadow of death but you will lead me the one thing I know is true is that I may sit at the table of mine enemies the people come on somebody you got to hear me now you're going to have to eat dinner with the people who oppose you you're going to have to eat lunch with the people who talk about you but in the midst of your enemies you've got an ally that is sitting right by you and you're going to be able to smile in the face of criticism smile in the face of opposition because he is your advocate he's with you come on somebody shout amen hallelujah I'm closing so look how Jesus responded I love it I love it okay I'm flawed I'm flawed. But you know what we like to do? What I like to do. Somebody's going through a hard time. Somebody's complaining about how bad things are. The mercy side of me comes out. He says, oh, I feel so bad. Oh, I need some extra hug time. So I'm using my wife right here. This is my wife, by the way. Woo, that was close, wasn't it? Man, YouTube about blew up. Oh, I feel so bad for you. I know, I know. You've got it so bad. Oh, you've got it horrible. You know what? Jesus did not even address his complaint. Now, I'm not being harsh. I'm just telling you the word. You know what Jesus said? He said, get up. He said, go. Come on, bring it up. He said, go. 
He said, go in this thy might. He didn't even address how bad it was. He said, you know what, Gideon? Yeah, maybe you're right. But you know what? You got to get up and you got to go. You know what I'm telling you right now? You can wallow in your pain and you can wallow in how bad it is all day long and it will never change. But the moment that you get up and say, I have the might and the power of the Almighty upon me and you get up and you start fighting the battle again and stop complaining about the mire of what you are going through. Listen you got what you need just get up and go fight amen look at your neighbor say get up get up <laughs> Woo! get up hallelujah just get up <laughs> yeah that's a word for you just get up get up there's a battle to fight Get up, there's an enemy to win against. Get up, there's a world that needs Jesus. Get up, there's a church that needs to be built. Get up, amen, Jesus is coming again. Just get up, amen. Oh, give him a hand clap of praise right now. Oh, give him a shout of praise in this house. I need some warriors. I need some champions. I need some warriors. Oh, I'm going to switch it around. Song number two. Mac, I want that song. I know I'm throwing you for a loop right now. But I'm telling you, I need some champions that are in this house. That will not lay down and say, I'm done. Will not sit down and say, I quit. Will not lay in the mire of what was. But they're going to get up and move into what will be. Amen. I said, I need some champions. I said, I need some champions. We're not done. <laughs> I said, this church is on. Come on, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I need some champions. I need some champions. Champions. We're about to get up. Oh, come on, worship the Lord. Worship the Lord. Worship Him. Yes. 